Excuse me. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk, The Shimmy to the Left, and we'll explain to you why it's a shimmy and why it's to the left. Um, so before we start, I'm going to say that this talk is not for the security experts. It's for the normies, for the credential <laughs> leaking vulnerabilities out there. So we won't be asking about the passwords. Though, and I am one of them. I'm just a walking vulnerability. Um, and we're going to teach you a few secure coding essentials demonstrated in Go, of course. So I hope that you'll enjoy the session. Ah, no, it doesn't work. Yeah, there it does. Yeah, so um, I'm Adelina. I'm a tech evangelist and a Go engineer. And I'm a women who Go organizer who are now also a community sponsor. Um, I just want to say that Women Who Go is a global initiative with chapters. So no matter where you live. If you don't live in London, then hopefully you'll find a chapter there. And uh, the volunteers of the Women Who Go community have hearts bigger than that logo, so don't hesitate to join and reach out. I think that a round of applause right now is a, is a good idea. <laughs> and I'm Arta, Arthur. Whatever you pronounce, I can't pronounce it British way, but I did actually. So, uh, I'm a lead engineer at Form3. Um, I'm from Krakow. I haven't wrote a book yet, uh, and I'm working on payments. So, super fun stuff, yeah. And about Form3, as you know from the previous slide and like two sentences back, uh, we do real time payment processing. Uh, we are multi cloud, we are Go centric. I think that's the great way to uh, go for it. We have a sec DevOps culture, which we'll be talking about today, and we are completely fully, fully remote. That's why I live in Krakow, not in London, uh, which is great. OK, Adelina, take it away. So uh, to set the scene, I'm going to give you a brief history of DevOps and Sec DevOps and why that Sec comes there. And sometimes it's been put between Dev and Sec, whenever we put it. So ancient history. So who? amongst you was a developer in the early 2000s. OK, we got some people. So um, I, before the, the adoption of DevOps, um, we, what we saw was a difference, like a, a separation between Dev and Ops. They had different OKRs. They had different lines of management. So the Dev team had the goal to change the system, while the Ops team had the goal to maintain the system. At points, these two goals would be at odds. So in between them was the wall of conflict, sometimes known as the wall of confusion. So the ops and the dev team wouldn't be able to talk together. This led to like really long releases, difficult to change code. And IT professionals were kind of like, like sick of this kind of way of working. So in about 2007, a new methodology emerged. And this was DevOps. And it was a community roots um, methodology and initiative that was then adopted across the world. Um, the whole goal of DevOps is to remove that wall, remove and make everyone kind of like work together seamlessly. We, they, DevOps is a lot more than a, just agile. It's about owning the entire um, dev and ops pipeline. And you see here that like, as soon as you're finished and you're released and monitor, you start the process all over again. So it's all about communication and collaboration. And the whole idea was to be able to release code faster, fix bugs faster through communication, and best practices. Now, we kind of see that there's two specializations in the engineering community. In general, the people that look after the dev part, we, I could go ahead and call them product engineers. And the ops part are platform engineers. While they have specialized, these functions still belong to the engineering department and work together um, in order to deliver better, more secure, faster software. There is, so first off, how many of you work in DevOps organizations? 
Ah, we got some people. There we go. So I'm not telling you anything new. But what's really interesting is that the community actually never um, got together in a consensus to say what DevOps actually is. But we can agree on these DevOps best practices. So we have continuous integration and continuous delivery, the use of tooling to help us monitor and release our code. Then we've got automated testing, monitoring, and alerting to make sure that what we have in the ops part, that what we have released continues to be stable. And when it comes to the code part, we've got microservice architectures and infrastructure as code, making sure that that the developers have the ability to, um, to deliver their infrastructure in the same way as they deliver functional code. But when it came to testing, the DevOps community again had some, um, what's it called, they, they couldn't agree. So we have the shift left movement, which moves testing early in the development process to find bugs earlier, while the shift right movement um, performs testing later in deployment with the goal of understanding how the system behaves under real conditions. We can easily categorize these tests that you see here between the left and the right. But our next problem is where do we put security tests? Because if you want to find security vulnerabilities quickly, you should be able to do it as early in the development stage as possible. But if you actually want to see that everything remains um, secure after delivery, then you should put them to the right. So where do they go? Well, the next iteration was Sec DevOps. And originally, DevOps didn't actually include security. So that is why Sec DevOps came about. And it brings security teams alongside DevOps teams that are already merged in order to find and follow best practices. As you can see, security measures or security work is part of the entire software development lifecycle. In the planning phase, we have threat modeling. In the development phase, we have secure coding practices. Then in build, you've got vulnerability scanning, making sure that all your dependencies are in a secure state. And then at the test phase, you could do penetration testing to make sure that you haven't introduced any unauthenticated endpoints or anything like that. On the ops side, we make use of tooling to make sure that what we've written not only was was secure, but stays secure. And we have security patching, security scanning, so these kind of go together. If Once you've released something, you might need to upgrade it without taking it down. Um, and then you've got configuration review. There's a lot of configuration and a lot of problems actually come from like insecure pass passwords, um, you know, in incorrectly configured endpoints and admin endpoints. Um, and finally, we've got perimeter scanning, which looks at the system at a, as a whole to see where an intruder could come in. But what we can agree on is that in, if you follow this model, which incorporates security best practices at every stage of development, then you can um, ensure to folk, uh, you can ensure that not only the code is delivered secure, but it stays secure. Uh, one last thing that I'd like to mention is that one of the key tenets of the Sec DevOps movement was education, developer education. So security teams shouldn't be responsible for the, all of the security of what, we, what we're delivering, but get engineering teams to own these actions and incorporate them. Now today, since this is a lot, right? Today we will focus on secure coding because we're developers and I think this will be a very, very interesting session for us to delve into. And the reason that um, we, uh, we've decided to take the session and talk about secure coding practices is because in our opinion, it makes developers better, makes us more, more, more well-rounded and it future-proofs our career because SecDevOps is here to stay.
And I'm actually doing more than just switching slides. <laughs> so right now, we'll be talking about OWASP. So who knows, like, show of hands, who knows what OWASP stands for? OK, so we need to do that. Right, OK. So OWASP is an open worldwide application security project, yeah, uh, which is a foundation which was established in 2001, 2001, which is a nonprofit that works to improve the security of software basically everywhere. And this is, again, a community with chapters, initiatives, trying to make software nicer, better, more secure. And every year, they release something which is called the top 10, which is a standard awareness document due to document. I can't speak right now. Based on community consensus. So the community goes and says, OK, we think this and that and this and that. So every year, it changes a bit. Uh, we won't go through all of the changes because then the talk would take around four to five hours, which we don't have. There's a coffee in, in the other room, so yeah. So we'll be talking about the top ten, uh, what the community decided are the major culprits of the security problems. So the first one is broken object level authentication. So the API expose object IDs. Uh, we don't have proper authorization checks for operation using a provider user ID. So you probably had that in your API at least once. And then the second one, which right now you might go, OK, but why broken authorization isn't the first one? Well, community says so. So, so broken authorization means that you have faulty uh, authorization mechaniz mechanisms. So attackers can basically you know, be anywhere anyone within the systems that they attack. Then the broken object property level authentication, which is the API exposed sensitive data. Then we go even deeper, which is unrestricted resource consumption. So API requests can basically you know, leak resources from your API, which then can lead to denial of service. And then broken function level authentication, which um, allows the attacker to assume admin functionality within your, within your code base. And the solution for that is actually pretty simple, which is doing authentication of all sensitive operations on the back end. Uh, is anyone here a full stack developer? OK. So the person here. Do you do authentication on the front end or on the back end? Yeah, yeah. But basically, like, don't believe the front end, don't believe the user, don't believe anybody, believe yourself <laughs> in the small back end thing. And even not that, like, on the back end, validate everything you do, and then you will be all hunky dory. Can we have the next slide? Yes. And then five more. So then you have unrestricted, unrestricted access to sensitive business flows. So, you know, users are clever. And we know that, and we've been building software for a while now, so users can do anything. And hackers are even more clever because they are users with malicious you know, intents, which is even worse because they can do whatever they want. So you get a promo promotional campaign, it's all going super well, and then you have this one pesky user who wants to break it. Well, this is bad. Then you have server-side request forgery. So you can do a request without any authentication on this end of things, even if you have a firewall protection or any protection whatsoever. Then you have security misconfiguration, so you have an API that can be like, you know, made, tailor-made for the user. And again, coming back, users are users, and there's chaos with the users, and malicious users are even wrong, well, like, even worse, because they're malicious and they're users, so this is a very bad combination. Then you have improper inventory management. So who has documentation of all the APIs at the workplace? Like, please, like, everybody just raise hands. Like, it's going to be recorded. OK, now, the follow-up question. Who likes writing documentation? Like, there's, what, like 15 of us, maybe 16 out of? 70 people, so this is basically that. Because how can you know what you have if you don't know what you have? And memory is fading, and we had to talk about memory leaks from Liam like half an hour ago, and memory leaks are real in every sort of way. And then last but not least one, you have unsafe consumption of APIs. 
So if you have another API within your API and it's not secured, it's basically a chaos threat bomb in your API that can do whatever, whenever, and then Shakira comes into play and starts to sing, which is a really bad thing. And then the solution to it is everything that goes external in your API needs to be validated and limited on the back end. So if you are trying to use Matt Ryer's library, he's a nice guy, but don't believe him. Just like check what he has. Maybe he's trying to get your you know, IP, I don't know. I haven't said that. OK, so the OWASP, as you can see, gives you a series of best practices, and it's easy to write secure code from the very start rather than being on this end of things and then going, hey, security, <laughs> and then there's no security, and there's insecurities, and you don't want to get there, especially with your software. OK. So we've got the background out of the way, and we hope we've gotten you pumped for some security best practices. So let's have a look at what we can actually do in some code. OK, so first off, the first thing we can do is enable client-server security. So the way we do that is by enabling HTTPS on our servers, encrypting data with the public key, and then setting timeouts to prevent DDoS attacks. So you can do more stuff than what I'm saying here, but these are like absolute minimums that you should do. So the way that H so I've included this um, just to give you kind of an idea about the public key and the private key pair. So the way it happens, this is the TLS handshake that's explained here. So first, the client comes and says, hey, I want to connect to the server. Then the server responds by sending the public key. The client generates a session key and encrypts it with the public key. And then on the other side, the server, which has kept its private key, private, because that's why it's called a private key, um, is able to decrypt the, so the session key. And then you can begin an encrypted data transfer. And for me, it was a little bit like, why do we need the session key? Like, I can just encrypt with the public key. Well, because the session key is generated on the client, we can't then have someone come and steal the connection and pretend to be the authenticated client. So it's actually quite clever. I don't know if you realize. But what about certificates? Like, I only talked about the public key. Well, if I gave you a public key and I said, I'm the queen of Go or whatever, then how would you know to trust it? I could convince you. I could be very convincing. But it's better if someone else that you trust tells you, hey, she's the queen. Um, and this is what certificates do. Trusted certificate authorities, or CAs, then issue certificates which contain the public key and some extra information. So the public key can't be then used for um, like another organization or another domain. You can also create self-signed certificates, but they are uh, considered bad practice, and your browser will complain if you try to use one. So in general, you should, um, when you're using certificates, you should generate one um, from a, a CA. And one very beloved certificate authority is Let's Encrypt, which is free to use. OK, so when it comes to web frameworks, so the reason I've included this is because we will be using in our demo a web framework. And we know that the Go community has a love-hate relationship with some web frameworks. And the reason I've decided to even use one is because it's easier to implement secure web handlers, and they have a lot of like really useful middleware. Um, you see here some of the um, most common ones or the most popular ones. We've got Jin, Echo, Fast HTTP, Gorilla, Fiber, and there were a load more. Um, but um, you know the the main thing to take is you don't have to use one, but it makes it easier to write fundamental things. And if, you, if you're starting to think about security, then it makes sense to choose a web framework and hopefully choose it together with your team, because then they will have to use it as well. So in this demo, I've decided to use Echo. Um, 
It, the reason I've decided to use it is A, because I'd never used it before and wanted to check it out. So yeah, you know, like I'll now tell you also about my thoughts about Echo. But um, it has easier routing and lots of really useful middleware. Um, once you start it up, you'll see this really cool ASCII art. Um, but of course, this is from their website. But of course, we will not be using HTTP. We'll be using HTTPS because we established that that is what we should do. Also, anything we'll go through in the demos can be easily done in everything. Yeah. So you can go bare bones, and you can do Go with Go without frameworks, and you will be able to do that yeah. as well. A really good point. You could also use Gen. Our demos are like really easy to uh, replicate, but I've just decided to use Echo. So what I'm going to show you now is we are the way that I've um, generated a certificate with M Make Cert, which is like this really cool little CLI tool, which creates a little. Um, in order to make it easier, it creates a trusted CA that you can have locally, and then you can issue a certificate from that. Um, then we will create a local server that's configured with TLS, and we'll see how Echo makes that easy breezy. Um, OK. So let's have a look at what I've done here. So first, I've got a certificate file and a key file, and they are secret and get ignored here. So um, obviously, like I've put them here so that it's easier to import them. And I'm using environment variables to import them in. Um, yeah, don't, you know, don't commit your private key, because then, obviously, anyone can impersonate you. Um, then the way we initialize Echo is with these three lines, um, and it creates a server. It's exactly the same way that we might create a regular server in HTTP. And then I set some configurations. And this is where I was talking about you know, what the port. Um, and we set some of those timeouts that I was talking about. So in this example, we'll actually use a three-second timeout. But that's like ages. You, know? you should set your timeouts in case someone decides to slow Loris you or to DDoS you. Um, then this, the, route, the root route is easily configured, and we respond with a JSON response. At the bottom here on line 57, I say we should serve TLS. So um, this is the listen and serve that we are familiar with from, um, from the net HTTP library. But in this case, I will only serve HTTPS requests. And then the port by default is 1323, because that's how I've done it. So that's all I've set up for you. It's a pretty nifty demo, but it shows how easy it is to actually set an HTTPS server. All of the demos that we see online are without the certificate, but with Make Cert, you can just issue one very quickly and use it for local development. Of course, you know, if you, once you go to production, you will have an actual certificate from a CA, but this is just for local development. So let me quickly um, here, I will just go run it as we always do, right? So it's demo one, mm -hmm. server dot go. So now it's listening. And um, I, in order to demonstrate some things, I've written some requests here. So if I get HTTPS, that'll be fine. You know, it says OK and hello gophers. And now, because I've said to, um, to Echo to only serve HTTPS, if I send the request with HTTP, then we'll have a 400 bad request. So actually now, nobody can connect with HTTP to our server. That's a pretty good start, don't you think? Oh, yeah. And also, and don't use that password because it cannot be used anywhere. No. What are we talking about? The password you have on the screen. Well, Security. that's for later. That's for later. Yeah, I know. Um, that's my purple puffin password. Yeah, that's how I log into all of my banking. Um, OK, we got that out of the way. Server up. Let's talk about a little bit about authentication. So um, the default way to do this is with JWT token, so JSON Web Token. I heard someone call it JWT, and that like revolutionized my life, but I will just keep saying JWT. JWT, yeah. 
Um, so you should implement session management for your backends. So not only for any restricted endpoints that like show um, that show some data that you might want to uh, that you might want to hide from others that are not logged in, but also for expensive operations. Why? Because someone can make put you in a world of pain. Um, so the way we do that is, for example, the use the client sends posts to login with a username and password. Then the server generates a JWT, JWT for the user. You send the encrypted JWT through TLS. You send it back. The client saves its token to storage, and then if it tries to get a restricted, um, a restricted endpoint, it now has to authorize itself with the JWT token that we've, uh, we've uh, previously established. Um, and once the communication goes further, then the server is able to validate the JWT token. And I'll talk a little bit more about what's in this JWT token in a moment, so do not despair. Um, however, none of this matters if your users choose garbage passwords like purple puffin, right? Um, so what you should do is leave no default passwords for your admin endpoint, endpoints and ensure some you know, basic password safety for your users. And what's better than one password, Artur? No password? Two passwords. Okay, uh, <laughs> so, um, in general, we do consider MFA as best practice, but this is outside of the scope of our little discussion here. But obviously, you know, it makes sense to think about that as you actually do software that goes to production. Also, you can take it as crazy as you want with request signing and whatnot. So, this is a very good starting point if you're starting out. Yeah. So we're really talking about yeah. basics. So now you're going to see more code as we go into demo two. So before, we've got a total of seven demos for those of you that are eager to know how long left. Um, so don't worry, we've got you. So uh, Echo provides a JWT middleware. It's one of the reasons I wanted to use a web framework so I don't have to do by everything by hand. Um, I've used a little a password validator from open source um, because I didn't want to actually do that myself. But it'll like stop you from doing like password one two three and random stuff like that. And then we will use bcrypt for hashing passwords for storage. Shall we have a look at the code? Let's roll. Let's get it, get this party started. Okay, so let's have a look at the server again. Ooh, let me close this because this is now confusing. Uh, yeah, so let's have a look at the server again. So everything above it is unchanged, so I'll only show you the new stuff. So the root route is still there. Hello, golfers. You know, I'm just, that's going to be unauthenticated. Then I've got a post for a sign up and another post for logging in. So sign up is for new users and logging in is for existing users. Um, and then we've got a restricted group here which says that, which configures um, the JWT token and then says that if you want to connect to this, then you'll have to have a JWT token. Um, this new claims func, so echo JWT exposes this new claims func, which is actually kind of cool because it allows you to create a custom claim and put any anything in it as a custom struct. So let's have a look see. So um, if I click on JWT custom claims, here I've put only the username and then I've embedded the registered claims which has expiry dates, all sorts of other stuff. If you wanted to, you could put admin, you could put roles, you could put other stuff. But for me, because it's a small thing, then I've decided to just do the username. Um, if I go back and we, let's have a look at the sign up or the login, whichever you want, but let's have a look at the sign up. So the way it works is we, when we create a handler, this is just for context, it doesn't really matter for security, but when we create a handler in Echo, um, off the context, we can read everything that was passed through either as a parameter or, or as a body for a request. So when I click, when I do that bind on line 15, this is just me reading the body. Um, it, then I call, I say, okay, I've read, I've got the username, I've got the password, let's call the ad, um, the ad from the uh, user service. So let's have a look at what that does. 
Um, for this purpose, I, I use a map to, to so store the users and the hashed password. And then when I add it, first I say, like, is there an existing user? If there is an existing user with that name, so I've decided to go with usernames as the primary. Um, then you have to log in instead. You can't overwrite an existing user. And otherwise, I call the password validator that I was talking about earlier, which validates the, like, the bare essentials of the passwords. You can add like entropy bits, and you can make it more complex, so that I left it just as default. Um, then I generate the password. Um, I generate the hash for the password, and I save that. We don't save passwords in plain text, because if anyone gets in and sees it in storage, then we will be in a world of pain. Um, so that's all that a user add does. So once I've verified that everything is fine, I create a custom claim, which um, is the right now just populates an expiry date, is, which is what you see there, which is for one hour. I don't know. You might want to do it for shorter. Depends. Um, and then it passes the username. So this is where I said we talk a little bit about a to what the JWT token is. As you can see, it's got three parts separated by a dot. So I, saw, I was reading a blog post, and they said, like, in the same way that you, when you drive a car, you don't need to know how the engine works, you can still use JWT without knowing what's inside it. But I decided to show you a little bit, just as a, you know, just a little bit of um, just kind of background. So the JWT token is not encrypted. That's Can you zoom in a bit, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. That's a good shout. Like, you should have shouted. Yeah. You did? Oh, sorry. I heard we nothing. Heard We're very yeah? sorry. Is this better? Next time, we need to play like a telephone. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. OK, so just to check in, is the back row seeing all we have here? No, bigger. <laughs> I really like that the right side is just going, yeah, man, yeah. And the left one, no. Is this better? OK. OK, okay so the JWT token has three parts separated by a dot. That's what I was saying. And it, the JWT token is not encrypted. It's only base64 encoded. So I can decode it, no worries, and we can see what's inside it. And what's in, the first part is known as the header. The second part is known as the payload. And the, the last part is the signed, uh, the signed part. So what does this mean? What does this mean? So what I'll tell you what it means. I know you're dying to hear. Uh, so the pay, anyone can see the username. And anyone could, for example, I could put Arthur there and then base64 en uh, encode it and pretend like that's my token. But that wouldn't work. Why? Because of the last part, which, is, which has the signed secret. The signed, uh, the, signed the signed hash is done with a symmetric algorithm. And the symmetric algorithm means that you can encode and decode with the same secret. However, the, only the server has this super duper secret, which we call the signing key. So if I were to change that payload and base64 encode it, then I'd, I'd know that the token was tampered with because the server, once it applies the, the, um, the signed secret with the algorithm, once it, uh, it applies the signing key to the payload with, with the symmetric algorithm, it'll know that this, doesn't, that this secret doesn't match to what's written in the payload and will throw away the JWT token. And in case you don't believe, uh, this is the easiest way to hack into things. If you've been into hacking space, there's one really good site with hacking exercises, etc. And back in the day, to get into that site, you had to hack the JWT token in exactly this way and to get all the information in and out. And it means like if it's a training exercise, there's a very high chance that somebody is actually able to tamper with everything you have. So again, users and then users with bad you know, in purposes. That's the, the whole spiel here. 
So then the server on line 39, the sign string, all of this process happens. So it takes the payload and does the signing with the secret, which in my case, by the way, it's called my super duper secret. Um, <laughs> but use the proper secret, you know. Um, proper and then secret. if there's an error, then we return an HTTP error. Otherwise, we return the token. Um, and then the user it will be considered signed in, and then they have the token, and they can and continue doing their like fun stuff and get access to the restricted path. If we go to the restricted path, this is very small, obviously. So first, I get the, the JWT token, which in Echo is by default saved under this user key. Then I'll get the claims off it. And on the claims, I can get the username. And then the only thing I'll be doing is validating the user. So I won't click through it. Actually, yeah, maybe I will. Just go. Just changed my mind. Yeah. So the only thing that I'm doing here is to see if the user exists. Um, other than that, I will do nothing else. But you might want to say, like, do you have this role for this restricted path? Whatever you want. Um, and then if that all checks out, I tell you that you're logged in. So that's all we've got. And this is how you easily set up JWT authentication with Echo. Pretty easy peasy, right? So I'm going to kill this because it's the, I need to go to the, de the second demo. And then I'll show you how it works in practice. So if we go back to my request. Um, so first, I'm going to sign up a user. And you see here how we respond with the token um, with purple puffin 123. Um, then this it also demonstrates the login. The login will do the same. Um, and then if I try to now, as part of the, uh, the reason I've, I've been coded it so I don't have to go around copy pasting it. So this is what, this is a parameter that's then put in the authorization header. Um, and then the user can use this token to then send the request. Oh, oh Welcome sorry, it's to the login. Coding. So let me just do the login. So there's the login. And uh, then here the request, and you're logged in. And that is my username, Adets, which is also my um, GitHub handle. OK. So that's how uh, now the user is able to log in and go to this like super restricted path, which is what we wanted to. We wanted to yep. like uh, um, enforce some authentication. The next thing that we do is modifying resources. So we want to enforce control policies in the back end for insecure direct, uh, direct object references. So you know, this was one of Arthur's top 10, is um, people modifying things that they shouldn't modify. Yeah. So what, what I'm demonstrating here is I'm going to create some secret notes on my restricted path. And these secret notes belong to a user, user1, and that I'm going to say is the username. Um, if, they, if you're logged in, you should be able to see your notes and add new notes. but. If the hacker is able, if they see, OK, that's user one, what if, what if I try to access user two? They're already logged in, so we, they, they're already logged in. And if I don't check that they have the actual, um, that they have the correct, uh, the correct rights to this, to, this, uh, to this resource, then um, they could actually get access to stuff they're not supposed to get access to. So. How do we do that? Well, we have already everything we need to be able to do that. Um, because um, we have the JWT token, which contains the username. Remember that? That was pretty, pretty clever. I thought oh, about yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Um, OK, so I'm going to close this again. Um, and then we will see the third demo. OK, so the third demo here. Um, everything else is the same. I'll show you only the new stuff. So on the restricted path, which, in, which says that you must be logged in, I'm now adding um, a get for some secret notes, which gets all of the secret notes for a given user, and a post, which adds a secret note for um, that, the same user that's passed with this ID. And the only thing that we will need to change, I've made another handler, uh, two more handlers for this, which I'll show you very quickly. So 
When I add a user node, what I do here is, OK, let me validate the token, validate the user. And here, I check that the name that I was given from the token, which we know is it hasn't been tampered with because of the signing and all of that, we see that it's the same as the parameter name. And if you don't own that, the, if you're not, not the user that you're trying to add a node for, then I tell you, no can do. Um, and I, inv I then finally, if you do pass, I add the note and I respond 200 OK, and I give you your username and your secret notes. Um, I do the same authentication for getting the user notes because, again, I wanted these notes to be secret. Um, so that's all I need to do because I'm using Echo, which makes my life loads easier, right? Um, so I'm just going to demo that very quickly, and that'll be the last runnable demo that I do for you today. So we'll do demo three. Um, and then let's have a look at these requests. So I'll go from the top again. I will sign up the user. I will then log in. Uh, the restricted path will obviously still work because I'm logged in as myself. I'm going to add a secret note with the JWT and the user, so like the token is again parameterized. And I'll say, OK, this is, I'm excited to be at GopherCon again, and this is your username. If I fetch the secret notes, it'll show the same. There you go. Yeah. Then I am going to sign up another person, which is my hacker. So they'll have their own JWT token. And then they will use the hacker JWT and try to get access to my user, to my user notes, which they shouldn't be able to do. Imagine if they do. Um, so it says, no, you're not logged in. The resource that you're trying to fetch doesn't match your token. Go away. Um, and it responds with a 401 unauthorized, which is the status code that we should be using. So that's how I've, um, I've made sure that my resources are protected. The last thing we want to talk about is, of course, SQL injection. So how many of you still do use um, a SQL database at work? Yeah, so see, it's very, it's very yeah, There's it a few sense. people. Yeah. Um, so I always thought that if I use an ORM, then I would be protected. But we are not protected, unfortunately. So SQL injection, we all know and we all love it. Um, so you pass an invalid ID, and then you've got the accounts or like notes or whatever. And uh, once, what this um, ID will make the database return all the rows, and then we will cry because we've sent compromised data to the hacker. And the best way that we are able to protect ourselves against that is with prepared statements. So prepared database statements separate input from code, so that makes it, e that, that makes it easier for us to separate untrusted input from trusted SQL statement. So I won't run this one because it's exactly the same functionality. But in the fourth demo, I've removed that little map that I was using yeah. with a Postgres database that's running in Docker. So I'm just going to show you the database operations only. So the prepared statement looks like this. I'm using the dollar signs because this is Postgres. But if you're using MySQL, then it's the question marks. Um, so the way it works is I prepare the statement. Um, I, I receive, in order to add a note, I put like three parameters for ID, username, and text. Um, and then I um, execute the statement, which says, OK, this is, this is the prepared statement parameterized, run it, please, database. Um, and then the select is also uh, doing a prepared statement, because that's actually the one that we really needed to protect from, um, to protect from SQL injection, yep. because it has the potential to return everything, right? Um, Row scanning um, works in exactly the same way as a regular SQL, but it's just that we're doing the prepare for further up, so we could have also not prepared it and then done the same kind of query. So that's all I've got for you for my demos. Um, oh, I forgot to click this one. Oh, I use database SQL, which is the the default one because I didn't want to uh, put more like tooling that you had to now use. So I've done the sec dev part. I'm going to hand over to Arthur, who will to show you more about the ops part. Um, so take it away, Arthur. 
So we've been talking about the programming end of things when you create the code. And before it hits the, hits the production, we can still do a bit more things. OK, so first question, again, you will need to show me either your right hand or the left hand. Who's using pipelines at work, CICD pipelines? Nice. OK, keep them, keep them, keep them, keep them. <laughs> Who's writing them actively? Who's maintaining them? Almost everyone. OK, that's really cool. So pipelines. People, people, pipelines. But basically, uh, for the for yes, you can you can bring the hands down. Thank you. For our demo, we will focus on GitHub actions. But everything we will do can be done. Basically, anything you can run your own pipelines if you really want. So, we will focus on the code before it merges to master. This is the this is our setup. So we want to check at every stage before the code actually joins its peers if it's actually good or bad. That's the first bit. And then the second bit, we will touch a bit about fast testing in Go. Who's, a, who's using fast testing in Go right now? OK, OK, not much, but it will be next best thing since sliced bread eventually. So what it allows you to, like, imagine, imagine you have your code, and it's a like, really nice nifty box. And then I put it here, and then you stand in line, and every and each one of you tries to break it. Don't care about the documentation, don't care about anything. You're just trying to break it with anything that you have at your disposal. And this is basically fast testing. It takes your function. It, as you can see, you can set up what will be as the corpus of the fast testing. So you can say, OK, please start with this, and then go crazy with it. And then you go. You pass it into your function, and then the function goes crazy, literally. Uh, we can only use the primitive types in Go. Like, you can't do custom fast testing on structs yet, I think. So that thing as a starting point is enough. So we will be doing some codes. There's like three different um, demos that will be extremely short, extremely sweet. So. Nothing, just let's go. I'm, I'm just stop talking. OK, let's kill this. He's checking out a branch to show you. Oh, sorry. Git status. Git oh, I changed that. Just go back and restore. Go. I'll show you why Vim. And I know that Adlina's Vim setup is basically non existent. And this is actually rather important for, for our, our demo, lint. So this is the Golang CI lint setup I have for the pipeline. It's absolutely bare bones, taken literally out of the website, so you can see how easy it is to add to your code. You know, super simple, which is go, hey, default linter, just lint my code. OK. So we did that. And then in my code, I actually did this. So this is like absolutely got stupid error. You know, it's like I'm not using that, I'm not checking the errors. You know. But if you're using Vim and if you're using it bare bones or you like SSH into a machine and you don't have time to set up, this can happen because we're only humans, we make mistakes, you know. So if I go to GitHub right now. This is, as you can see, I've added that a while ago just to make it all faster. And right now we have one check, which is Golang CI Lint. And if I go to details, it will yell at me that this is really small, but I will tell you what it says. So in here it says on in server go, whoa, I made it big. scary code. <laughs> Server.go, line 109, string declared and not used. You've seen that before. It's all nice and all easy. OK. So that's demo five. We've just added the pipeline. So now, uh, demo six. LS, beautiful. So this is the second runnable action I've added to our GitHub um, repository, which is Go Security um, Linter. You can add it as a piece of your Go Lint um, setup. 
or you can have it as a standalone, or you can use any third party thing because there are many, and I'm not selling any uh, software because they haven't paid me so. So in this case, it's open source. You can securely check your code. So if we go into our demo six, pam, 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 you can see we have yet another Go Security. Let's see what it says. And the reason why I'm not showing you any code is because I don't think it's important right now. The more important bit is Go Security gives you actual levels of security implications for your code. So for example, you have this one, which is you have errors unhandled. If you've done the first funk, you know that the security linter is sometimes going to be up your alley. But then if we have this one, this is a bit more tricky. Because we go use of weak random number generator, math rand instead of crypto rand, confidence medium, because it's not extremely confident, it's just a machine, but it goes with se severity high. And we can go into the nitty gritty of why math random isn't secure compared to crypto random and etc. But if you have been using random number generators, you probably have like a teeny faintiest idea about random numbers and that in computer science they are not really random unless you're using plutonium to make them random. <laughs> but I don't think we have access to that. <laughs> so that's the second bit. And now the third bit, which is first testing. Uh, demo seven. Okay. So for, the, for demo seven, I haven't actually added it as a uh, GitHub action yet, because if you want, you can fork it and you can test it because it will follow exactly the same principles. So let's go to demo seven. And we will go into database. And I will show you first the difference, different stuff I did to the database, which is. Yeah, the oh, no, you don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, your setup is non existing at all. Get user, bam, 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 bam. Is this transaction? Yeah, I know. OK, here. Yeah. So you, we've added some validation setup. As you can see, this is super tough validation. So our username can only contain lower, lowercase, ASCII characters, no numbers, and be shorter than 10 characters. So we are very specific what the users can be named or can't be named. And then in the testing, there is a joke in here, but I'm not going to explain that. You have to figure out yourself. It's fun, chaos stuff. So what I did right now in here, I've set up my mock uh, database, so I don't have to spin up my container. It's all mocked. I could have spinned the container. You know, doesn't matter. The password, this is actually my Facebook password, which is a super secret password. It used to be, actually, no, not joking, but I was 19, so don't judge me. So, and then we go into fast testing. So we said that our corpus of our test will be William Elvis John Kennedy. And then we will pass it into the fast testing. It will actually pass automatically. And then it will go in here. It will actually try to add the user to the database with all the things. OK, so if you haven't used um, fast testing in Go, it can't be simpler. So you can go this, and then you go this, add user. So I'm telling my Go test to be verbose, and I'm telling you, OK, use fuzz. Let's go with it. And now it breaks. Yes, beautiful. So. As you can see, right now, my first testing is like extremely super simple. Because as you remember, our corpus is William John Kennedy, William John Elvis Kennedy, or William Elvis John Kennedy. Yeah, that, in that correct order. And then it went, error during processing contains uppercase W. And if we go, uh, no, we, go, we won't go because you don't have the setup. But normally, if you would have the setup for fast testing, you could have the corpus which actually yield the error. So if you put it in the pipeline, you can make your fast testing running, I don't know, as a cron job every six hours or so. 
and then it will try to break whatever it is allowed to break. Um, and as a, like, you know, secret of the trade, I've been using FOSS testing since it's out in Go, which is Go 1.19, if I'm correct, I think. And it has been a blessing, because then you don't have to pretend you're the user. You have a machine pretending that they're the user, and they're trying to break it. Using, that, using it as a password validation, if your validation is OK, if your regex is actually regex, it's absolutely great. Using as a username validation as a, any sort of input validation, is absolutely great. And then if you remember, we had this beautiful eight-step circle, right? So this bit can go just before you deploy stuff, but also it can go when you actually deploy stuff and it's actively in the production, because then you can keep it running all the time. And then once in the blue moon, it will go, OK, it's messed up. So you can go and fix it. And you don't have to be worried about a user being pesky and just going, OK, I'm going to break it. And they do break it, and it's really bad. Thank you so much for listening. This brings us to our conclusions. Um, I hope that you've learned loads from this session. So first off, we want to leave you with three thoughts. So first off, as we hope that we've shown, is that incorporating secure coding practices doesn't have to be hard. Once they are top of mind, you can add them easily to your, to your code with the help of web frameworks. And then with the security tooling, you can make it even more secure. We've been talking about CI CD pipelines. You can add it to your functional test and verifications to be 100% sure that your code is actually secure. And the last thought is like, in order to embrace Sec DevOps, you need to embrace a culture of security and um, upskilling of engineers. So make sure that everyone feels like it's OK to ask questions. Security is a perhaps more difficult topic. Um, so definitely help your fellow engineers to implement these kinds of um, secure coding practices that we talked about. So this brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. Our colleague Patricia will also be speaking tomorrow about more secure coding practices. So um, that's all we've got for yep. you today. Thank you. Thank you very much.